I want to thank you all for taking the time, making the effort. Uh, hopefully the weather will, will be good for us this year. You remember last year we lost today because of six inches of snow. They're calling for snow Friday and I don't care because um, we'll be done. Uh, but if you will, um, as we start every uh, ASNI event, would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Again, uh, for those of you just coming in, my name is Rick White, and I've had the pleasure of uh, serving as the chair for the past year. I think you're going to find this agenda stimulating. I think it's as broad and as, as uh, and deep and technologically challenging as I have seen in the many years I've been working for ASNI Day. And I already know that some of you are going to complain at the end of tomorrow that you couldn't see it all. That's great. That's probably the best compliment you can give the committee. We purposely designed the event that way. There are, there's a, a fine point in putting an event like this on with packing the agenda full, creating the conflict, or stretching it into two or three and maybe four days. Um, burnout becomes an issue, and if you happen to be the uh, last speaker at the end of the fourth day in a long symposium, you're talking to your staff, um, and they're the last people that want to hear you talk for the podium. So we did cram it full. I want to encourage all of you to make sure you take time to go visit our exhibitors. There's some different things here, and tomorrow afternoon, our closing panel will be PEO submarines talking about the Ohio replacement program. And that's been in the news. It's, uh, it's certainly of concern to all of the acquisition community. I think the technological advantages uh, and challenges coming that, in that program are, are going to be stimulating, and I, and I hope you all stay around. We've added quite a number of uh, new events this year that may not be apparent as you look through the agenda. We have a very vibrant young professionals program. The society, and if you look around here um, and turn around and look left, right, front, back, you'll see that the majority of us, and probably you more than me, have gray hair, um, but those of us who've been doing this for a while are very concerned. Where are our reliefs? It's the same faces at the same time at all the same meetings and the younger people are, and I'm talking to the 35 and under crowd, those are the folks that we need to engage. It's the, the millennials, it's the Twitter, the Facebook, the YouTube society. All of those technologies, those instant communication things are foreign to us. And uh, trying to teach us dogs how to use those tricks to recruit people is a challenge. Uh, so we're hoping that the young professional program will, will engage and start to get some of those people in, involved. We also have a couple of floor speakers that will be in on the uh, display floor this year. Um, they are uh, spread throughout the program. There's one this, morning, this afternoon, uh, there's one tomorrow, um, and, and the idea is to do a town hall format. Uh, they're talking from a stand-up position, uh, no chairs, but just come and stand up and ask them some questions. Uh, we also have a, a sp uh, program with NASA and AIAA. We've reached out to a couple of our other organizations that are technical in nature and, and they have sessions and they're focused really on technologies within the aeros aerospace community that have potentially um, implication and application across the broad field of naval engineering. So we're pretty excited on that. We have a very broad uh, professional development program and this year um, all of the technical papers that were submitted once reviewed by the committee all of them were accepted. They were that, that broad, that excellent, um, and I want to thank that professional community uh, for, for looking at those papers. Once again, we're hosting the Global Shipbuilding Executive Summit, and that's kind of neat. I'm not sure mo most of you know, but that's a biannual event, once here and once in India. Um, so having them here uh, is really a pleasure, and we're very excited to, to do that. Like I said, I've been doing this for about a year. Um, planning for next year starts Monday. Yes, it does take about a year to put this together. Um, so I want to encourage any of you that think you might be inclined to participate in some way to either see me personally over the next couple of days or to stop by the registration desk and leave your name with anybody there. Um, and we'll be, be happy to uh, put you on the list and, and contact you in the near future. I also want you to keep your eyes open for upcoming events. We've got FEMIS East Coast coming up in a few months. 
Uh, we've got Mega Rust, another combat system symposium will, will be there. Admiral Hill has really put his, his weight behind an additional, an annual combat system symposium, and, and Joe Johnson is running with that. We've got a MAC symposium and then the, the multi-agency craft, and then we also have a launch and recovery symposium coming up. So I want to I wanna thank everybody and encourage you to come out and participate in those. I do have to spend some time thanking a couple of groups of people. Uh, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't. First of all, our sponsors. Um, f without our sponsors, without the people out on the exhibit booth or on the exhibit hall, this event would not succeed, quite honestly. It's, it's their dedication, it's their internal dollars, it's their internal time and effort that really makes uh, this effort, it makes us available to, to put this effort on for you all, and, and I want to thank them. Uh, specifically, I want to thank our platinum level sponsor, General Dynamics Mission Systems, and they're also the sponsor of the Honors Gala this evening. Our gold sponsor was Lockheed Martin, and our silver sponsors were Huntington Ingalls and Northrop Grumman, and Northrop, I believe, also sponsored the breakfast out there this morning. So as you walk around, thank them. Um, it's, it's very important for them, you know, to know that you care, and we do. And our bronze level sponsors were ABS, DRS Technologies, General Atomics, Philadelphia Gear, SAIC, Siemens, and Tridentis. Please encourage all of your people and you to, to go visit and just walk the floors. If you've ever had, if you haven't had the, abil uh, the opportunity to be a booth bunny and stand on your feet for eight hours a day in a booth and, and realize how wonderful that your legs feel by the end of the day, you, you don't know what you're missing. So please stop by and, and see those folks because I think it's very important that they know we care. The second group of people I need to thank are my volunteers. Um, there's about 40 of them. They're listed in your program. Um, I'm, we were remiss in Bill Boulay, thank you, um, but uh, we, we left his name off the program. Um, that was on purpose. That was my fault, Bill. But anyways, these folks have been doing the behind the scenes work for a, the last year, and I literally mean the last year. Um, Lee McHugh has already arranged for the dates and reservations for 2017 and 2018, but it does take that long to put this symposium together. Um, they've been herding cats, making phone calls, trying to figure out how do we change uh, this, this block to this block, putting it all together, and, and that is by, by no means a simple task. And it's done mostly by telephone call, um, once a month, then twice a month, then weekly, then a couple of face-to-faces, so they've done a fantastic job, and I thank them all. And finally, the ASNI staff, under the direction of Lee McHugh. This group of people um, have had their fair share of challenges this year, but I want to tell you, I haven't seen a more dedicated and professional group of folks whose sole purpose in life is to make this event as seamless as possible for you all, to allow you to, uh, to get as much out of it as you can and to kick down the barriers. Hopefully you've seen that at the registration where you show up and they've gone electronic, they print your badge out right there. Um, and, and the color of the badges is still important. If you're well, wearing yellow, I won't call you by name, but, you know, join. Um, if you're wearing red, uh, that's a good thing. Um, so anyways, and our goal this year has been to put together the most challenging program. We specifically have talked to program offices about staying away from the, uh, the Rotary Club pitch. Uh, my budget, my schedule, my staff, that's great. Save that for the other agencies. What we wanted to do is challenge the programs, the projects, the, the talks. Let's hear some of your technical issues. Because if you're having a technical challenge in shipbuilding program A or weapon system program B, I will guarantee you, based on my background and experience, that there are several others that are having that very same program. And like most of our Department of Defense, we do it in silos of excellence. So it would be nice to be able to learn if something else, somebody's having that same challenge and cooperate to, to share across, uh, going on the horizontal. As needs re membership, you all represent the, the very finest that the Navy has to offer, that the nation has to offer, and I hope that we can work diligently and daily to continue engineering America's maritime dominance. And Secretary Stackley should be on his way down. I don't see him yet. So I'll, I'm open to any questions anybody has about the program. I'm told I had 11 minutes. I'm 1030 right now, so I'm fine. Any questions? Um, we, have had, we have a new executive director of ASNI, Lee McHugh. Please stand up. Um, Lee has done a marvelous job this year. And Tony Langrich.
our, um, our president has also done a marvelous job in, in keeping us all straight. So I want, I want to thank them. And we really have gone joint. We have the Army here. General, thank you for joining us from the Missile Defense Agency. I'm, I'm very pleased to have you. Um, so with that said, there's somebody coming in. I can Please excuse me, I can't see anything back there. <laughs> yeah, and um, Tony Langrich is, is going to do the introduction, and with that, I'd like Tony to come up to the stage. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I thank you all for coming this morning. I, uh, I'm going to have the distinct honor and privilege of introducing Mr. Sha Stackley, and I'll, I want to do that in just a second. But first off, I want to welcome the midshipmen who have shown up today. Please stand. All, all the middies. I was not one except I was an RTC guy. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Don't care what branch of the service you decide to become a part of. If you're an engineer, this is your society. This is where you belong. We take care of you. We educate you. We bring you forward in the future. You meet all the seniors, and your futures will depend on, in large part, who you meet, who you know, and who you show off to. So don't forget that this is your society. Now, all the young civil servants who are sort of 35 and under stand up. There better be a bunch of you out there. This is your society, too. The largest demographic that we can go after in terms of the society and the membership and the engineers is the civil servant engineers in our head, excuse me, in the headquarters and the warfare centers. If you're not standing, your job is to reach out to the people who are not standing, who are 35 and under, and get them to be part of this society. And I honestly don't care whether you're a member right away. I just want you to participate and come and get started, because once you get here, you're going to find it's an exciting place to be. Guys, go ahead and sit down. Thanks very much for coming. Okay, so I'm told the best introduction, let me start off this way, who does not know Mr. Stackley? <laughs> who has never been introduced to him? Therefore, no hands, a man who needs no introduction. The Honorable Mr. Stackley, if you'd uh, take the podium away from me before I blabber on, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Is that good enough? That'd be great. You want a little cream in? Or yeah, yeah. Okay. Make it look like khaki. Hey, good morning, folks. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning, the annual uh, uh, American Society of Naval Engineers. I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on this morning. Um, probably dip a little bit into the budget and uh, uh, save time at the back end for uh, Q and A. Um, and if, uh, if you all don't have questions, uh, trust me, I've got plenty of questions, so we'll, we'll fill the time appropriately. Uh, but, but first, uh, for this group in particular, I'm going to give you all required reading. I'm, uh, I'm reading a fantastic book right now called Transatlantic, and I, I highly recommend it uh, to everybody here. It is the history of naval engineering from about the period of 1820 to 1920. It goes from wood and sail to steam, from paddle wheels to propellers to iron, and it's, it's about the business side, it's about the engineering side, it's about the people, okay, that we have studied through college and, and grad school, Froude and Rankine, Cunard, Isambard, Brunel, Transatlantic by Stephen Fox. Pick it up, you'll enjoy it, you'll learn a great deal, and then you're going to pass it on to somebody else that, uh, that you care for. First, uh, I want to describe this is an oasis. Uh, it's a little bit of a vacation outside of this building, just a, about a quarter mile from here. There's a war going on. It's, uh, it's the budget war. It's the budget war. We're in, we're in the throes of this. The, uh, uh, this conference is, is typically conducted right uh, uh, in the midst of, of budget hearings. Anybody else need a cup of coffee while Tony's up? It, it, is a, it is a budget war going on out there, 
and uh, a far more friendly crowd here. Uh, faces that uh, I don't see as often as I'd like to, but uh, Navy, Marine Corps are here, Coast Guard is here, uh, I see uh, Jim Searing's on the agenda, so MDA is represented, syscoms and program offices, uh, warfare centers are here, and I know uh, ONR is uh, uh, playing a significant role uh, this year as well. Most significantly, um, our, our requirements community sponsors are participating, but the folks I'm most interested in uh, seeing participating throughout the couple days here are the universities, uh, ODU, MIT, Michigan, Webb, uh, Naval Academy, UNO, and on and on. The, the participation by the universities and the prominence that they hold in the agendas is pretty critical uh, to our future. I thought I'd uh, start uh, by briefly describing what's going on. Uh, this time of year it is natural to want to talk about the budget, uh, but that would uh, uh, spoil the opening to a very, uh, a very important engineering forum. So I'll come back to that, but first uh, spend a few minutes talking about what's really going on. Let me describe the month of March. LPD 26, the John P. Murtha, departed Ingalls shipyard yesterday on sea trials. And the same day, we received Ingalls' proposal for construction of LPD-28, the Fort Lauderdale, the 12th and final ship of the LPD-17 program. And today, the keel of SSN 796, the New Jersey, is laid at electric boat. And then on Saturday, the day after Mirtha gets back from sea trials, SSN 787, the Washington, gets christened at electric boat, which is followed on Monday by AGR OR-28, the Sally Ride, getting underway for her acceptance trials at Dakota Creek Industries in Washington. And on Tuesday, Bath Ironworks starts fabrication of DDG-120, our 70th Arleigh Burke-class destroyer. And then LCS-8, the Montgomery, gets underway for builder's trials out of Austell in Alabama, and jumping a few days later in the month, on the 21st of March, DDG-1000, the Zumwalt, our first new destroyer in 30 years, which successfully completed her first sea trial in Maine, off the coast of Maine in December, gets underway from Bath Ironworks for her builder's sea trials. And later in that week, on the 25th of March, Illinois, SSN 7086, heads out on trials. And on the West Coast, same week, LHA-6, the America, completes your post-shakedown availability. And then, we receive competitive proposals for three major new programs to be awarded this year. LHA-8, Big Deck Amphib, the new fleet, Future Fleet Oiler class, the TAOX, and contract design for the LSD-41-49 class replacement, the LXR. And then, we award L L LCS 25 and 26 by the end of the month move on to christen DDG-114, the Ralph Johnson, and lay the keel for SSN 790, the South Dakota. All the while, preparing CVN 78, the Gerald R. Ford, our first new designed aircraft carrier in four decades for sea trials this spring, and plowing lessons learned from the challenges encountered in building that lead ship of the class into driving down the cost of her sister ship CVN 79, the John F. Kennedy, casting her giant shadow in the dry dock at Newport News, all the while conducting peer side testing of DDG 113 and 114 and LPD 27 at Ingalls. Meanwhile, picking up the pace of design and development on the Ohio replacement program, having released the solicitation for detailed design and construction of the lead boat of that critical program earlier in the year, a month in the life of shipbuilding, all the while cruise and modernization of Gettysburg and Calpens commences on both coasts in planning and procurement to refuel George Washington, CVN 73, proceeds at Newport News and operational testing of Aegis Baseline 9 upgrade, Ram Block 2, and getting ready for some critical missile shots of our strategic systems program at sea. They press on and on and on, a month in our Navy. Now let me spend a moment to talk about the budget. We spend a year in the building 
building a budget. And as painful and counterproductive as it may seem, the process forces us to assess where we are, our size and shape capability of our Navy and Marine Corps, where we are with regards to operations, readiness, training, and maintenance, and then where we need to be relative to our requirements and relative to the threat today and for the future, and what's, what it's going to take to get us there, how much time and money. And in the case of shipbuilding and aviation, Congress requires us to put together a 30-year plan with our budget because that's how long it takes to build a Navy. And frankly, there's great wisdom to taking that longer view, and so we've instituted similar long-range planning for our research and development in our combat systems programs to guide our investments in those future warfighting capabilities that will ensure that our Navy is not just the largest Navy in the world, but it remains the most powerful Navy in the world. But ultimately, because in the end, we don't have enough time and we don't have enough money, the budget process drives debate. It drives decisions, it drives trade-offs, and then when we think we're done, we deliver that budget to the Hill, and the debate, it starts all over again. And for the Navy, that debate on the Hill, that's been going pretty well. In the course of the past three years, 2014, 2015, 2016, while other services budgets have been cut, Congress has increased funding for ships and shipbuilding by about $8 billion above the Navy's request. Virginia, LPD-28, DG-51, the Future Fleet Oiler, the Expeditionary Staging Base, the Expeditionary Fast Transport, the LSD-4149 Replacement LXR, and modernization of cruisers, destroyers, and amphibs, these have all been increased in this toughest of fiscal environments. I say it is the responsibility of the Congress to provide and maintain a Navy, and the intent of Congress is clear. They want a strong Navy. So what shape are we in? In simplest of terms, size, we're a 272 ship Navy measured against a 308 ship requirement. And on any given day, about half of our ships are underway, and of that number, about 100 are constantly deployed. And as the CNO highlighted during his testimony just yesterday, combatant commanders' demands for naval presence only increases as the threats to our security increase around the globe. And the current shortfall to the size of our Navy has caused extended deployments, and in certain cases, reduced turnaround time between deployments. And the result in increased operational tempo ultimately impacts fleet readiness, our ability to surge additional forces in case of crises, our operations and maintenance costs, and our ships' schedules tied up in availabilities, and the service lives of our ships, and the welfare of our sailors. So accordingly, building the 308-ship Navy has been and remains our top priority. We loathe, we loathe cuts to our shipbuilding program. They are the least reversible, they have the longest term impact on our mission, and they have the greatest consequence to our industrial base. Well, the best evidence of this is what we're staring at today. Budget decisions made more than a decade ago triggered today's shortfalls to aircraft carriers, amphibious ships, and small service combatants, and they are the cause for the serious pending shortfall to our attack submarine force. And so our approach has been simple build a long-range shipbuilding plan that supports the 308-ship Navy defined by the Chief of Naval Operations Force Structure Assessment, and then budget and build the ships in accordance with that plan. And we're doing that. We've got 65 ships of 13 ship classes currently under contract and construction across eight building yards across the country. And the return to a 300-ship Navy by the end of this decade is absolutely assured, and we will reach that 308 ship requirement by 2021, absolutely assured. And we will maintain our priority on shipbuilding because it does take 30 years 
to build a Navy. But more than build new, we've got to maintain and modernize the fleet at sea today, our ships in service. The only way we can build to a 300-ship Navy is by ensuring that the ships at sea today are maintained and modernized and are kept relevant for the future mission. That's the job of the cruiser and destroyer mod, LSD midlife, carrier, RCOH programs. So come what may in the budget environment, we need, we must complete these efforts. But the focus of the shipbuilding program and the focus of the CNO's force structure assessment is about more than ship count. It's about capability. Our capability, our naval superiority, relies upon our technical superiority. And we have that technical edge with the fleet at sea today. And we have that edge in our fleet under construction. CVN-78, the Ford, with our electromagnetic aircraft launching system, dual band radar, all new reactor plant, advanced weapons elevators, provides increased carrier base strike, improved command and control, and increased survivability for our most critical asset. Virginia, our asymmetric advantage with the Virginia payload module, an acoustic superiority program expanding the capability and mission set and mission effectiveness of our attack submarine force. The Flight 3 destroyer with her air and missile defense radar, it's got a radar gain 40 times, 40 times that of the most capable radar afloat today, the SPY-1, and a missile, the SM-3 Block 2A to take advantage of that radar gain. Zumwalt, 78 megawatts of integrated power and a 155 advanced gun system, cutting edge stealth and automation providing capabilities for next generation land attack. A high replacement submarine, the Navy's top priority program being designed with the simple philosophy that this submarine will be the most survivable leg of our triad through to the year 2080. And the frigate upgrade to the LCS will provide over the horizon anti-surface and state-of-the-art anti-submarine capability particularly critical to PACOM. The amphibious assault ship and the landing ship dock LSD-41 replacement and the first of type expeditionary staging base that will provide amphibious lift, command and control, survivability required for future expeditionary warfare and the cruiser mod program to bring critical air and missile defense, electronic warfare improvements, and hull and mechanical and up electrical upgrades to ensure that those ships reach their full service life. In the course of this decade, the Navy will have transformed itself, recapitalizing virtually every major warfare system that we've got. And we need to ensure that we maintain that edge for our fleet and development. Because the fact is, we are facing an increasing threat. It promises to challenge our naval superiority. China's investments in its military, from nuclear submarines to fifth generation fighters to anti-ship crews and ballistic missiles, should keep everyone here awake at night. And Russia, Russia is regaining its blue waters capabilities. So we'll keep whole our investment in future capability and and we must remember where we draw our naval strength from. Because the strength of our shipbuilding and modernization program is inextricably linked to the strength of our industrial base. In many respects, the capabilities of our industrial base are the envy of the world. It goes with being the largest, most capable Navy in the world. But it's a capital-intensive industry requiring a unique, critically skilled workforce Today, comprising about 100,000 skilled manufacturing workers and designers, engineers at 20 shipyards, building and maintaining our ships across the country. And an equally number of skilled workers at factories across the country, providing critical components, major equipments, and weapon systems for those ships. Fact is, however, we're facing very real challenges with keeping whole that industrial base that we rely upon to build these ships and the weapons we need. And this calls for policies and practices that protect as necessary or at a minimum carefully weigh the health of our industrial base. And so 
in order to provide a stable, predictable workload that fosters investment in modern facilities and the retention of critically skilled workers, we've employed multi-year procurements, block buys, and dual sourcing where appropriate to maintain competition and capacity required to meet our long-term needs and foster industry investment. And in doing so, we've achieved an estimated $6 billion in critical savings across the most recent submarine, destroyer, littoral combat ship, amphibious and auxiliary ship contracts. And we've taken those savings and we've plowed that back in to building more. The challenge going forward and the question is whether the Navy, with the support of Congress, will be able to sustain the build rate required by that 308 ship Navy, while at the same time sailing against strong headwinds in the budget and strong challenges associated with our major programs, most notably the high replacement coming our way. Good news, Congress is focused on the size of our Navy and they're committed to the health of our shipbuilding industrial base. But that's not enough, it's not enough. Affordability will be critical, it will be a requirement. There's not a major program going forward that's not going to be subject to an affordability requirement. From the CVN 79, that John F. Kennedy, to the future frigate, to the ship to shore connector, to our amphibious warfare ships, not even the highest priority program, the higher replacement, will escape the need, the requirement for an affordability cap. And it can't be done by merely cutting the budget. Our strategy has been and will continue to be to drive affordability through the design, maintain an iron grip on requirements, and to sustain that year-over-year -year stability that we've enjoyed this past decade, and to compete wherever competition is possible, up and down the supply chain, and then leverage those multi-year procurements and block buys and incentivize industry to invest in their facilities and their, paper, their people. And the message to this group, if you want to be a successful naval engineer, you better be a good cost engineer. There's no other way forward. Which brings me to the final point. We need good people. We need good people. Developers, designers, builders, testers, maintainers, naval engineers. We're facing major technical challenges with the development, design, construction, and testing of our newest ships and aircraft and combat systems, these incredible weapon systems that we put in the hands of our sailors and Marines. Each has posed extraordinary challenges, but not insurmountable, and we need thousands of talented, dedicated naval engineers tackling these challenges across the country to advance the state and the science of naval warfare. The good news is we've got good people. We've got great people, and I've had the great privilege and pleasure of working with some of the finest inside the government and across the table with industry tackling the tough challenges that we've got. We've got great people, but we need more, more like them. And that, that is your job. That is your mission. You, the American Society of Naval Engineers. So read Transatlantic, get inspired, Read the paper, look at the challenges, look at the threat that we have, look at the fiscal environment that we're in. Do your best and then go out and recruit. Bring on some more good people. Because we are, we are the greatest Navy in the world. And our job is to make sure that we pass on the greatest Navy in the world to the generation that comes behind us. So thanks for the couple of days that you will spend here revitalizing. And with the time I've got remaining, I'd like to entertain any questions that you all might have. <laughs> Do we have rules? I simply want to know when you ask a question, are you from the press? Or are you from the uh, Engineering Society? Go ahead. I am a member of the American Society of Naval Engineers. Okay. <laughs> and I work at OSD. Yeah. 
offset. Yeah, you get 50% 50, 50 credit. Go, go yep. for it. <laughs> yep. Engineer first. I was curious. Uh, last December, the Russians set up a, uh, a joint command, sort of resembles a combatant command for the Arctic. I was wondering what you thought about that as far as a challenge for us. I'm sorry, joint command or joint command ship, did you say? Joint command. It's sort of like a combatant command for the Arctic. Um, I'll be honest, uh, that's pretty far outside of my lane, but I will, I will say that uh, if you save that question for 24 hours, when the CNO is standing here, he'll be prepared for it. I'll make sure. <laughs> okay, I will. The, the reality is, okay, I, um, uh, over the past year, I've been hit pretty hard about the fact that the United States Navy, where's, where's my Coast Guard friends? Ron, I saw you here, Ron Mabego. Oh, there we are, Ron. Uh, the Navy is getting pounded by, uh, by Congress, certain members of Congress, uh, because we are not building icebreakers. And uh, if, if you look at what our capability is, we've got two, one large, one medium-sized uh, icebreaker for the United States of America to deal uh, with the Arctic region. And uh, from, from these members' perspective, this is, this is bigger than a Coast Guard mission. This is a national security mission and should fall under uh, the Department of the Navy. Now, all, all that debate aside, the point, though, is very real. Uh, uh, international presence and the, uh, the strategic nature of the Arctic region, particularly as, as uh, global warming uh, uh, takes greater effect, is just becoming more and more important. So while Russia has 47 icebreakers, and while China is cruising the Arctic region, we, the United States of America, have one and a half uh, icebreakers. So I, you know, the, uh, uh, the Arctic is prominent uh, uh, in the CNO's, uh, CNO's guidance. Uh, whether or not uh, he's considering a joint command, or whether or not the department, whether or not the Navy is uh, considering participation in a joint command, I, I can't answer that directly. But I think uh, that question becomes uh, increasingly pertinent as time goes on. Please. Good morning, uh, Mr. Sackley. Uh, Amy Perlstein from BAE Systems uh, Ship Repair. My question is, is there any plans in 2016 for the remainder of 2016 to bring in work to avoid the massive layoffs that are going to happen this month on the East Coast and the shipyards? Yeah, that's, um, well, that's uh, let me just say, and this is not a throwaway comment, okay, um, I've been down, I've visited. Uh, spending a lot of time with uh, Admiral Galinas, who is a commander of uh, the Regional Maintenance Center, spent time with the CNO, taking a look at our workload versus, uh, in, in Hampton Roads area, uh, versus the impact to the workforce. 2016, we hit a valley, and you, you know it. Uh, we hit a valley for a number of reasons, um, but we're doing what we can to try to mitigate. Not enough, got that but what we can. We're trying to accelerate work. I mentioned the uh, CG64, the Gettysburg's modernization. That work is starting as I speak. Um, we pulled that to the left six months. Uh, Winston Churchill, we're pull pulling that to the left. Tortuga, we're pulling that to the left six months. We're trying to accelerate what we can, but we're also trying to find out what additional work can we put into this time frame. And uh, uh, we have uh, solicitations under evaluation right now. I'm not, we're inside of a solicitation period, so I'm not, uh, not allowed to discuss it. But uh, uh, key, uh, key work uh, uh, that we're evaluating includes uh, uh, foreign military sales, uh, av availabilities associated with frigates going to Taiwan. So we're not leaving any stones unturned. And uh, I'll tell you, Admiral Galinas is probably uh, working, has been working around the clock on this issue. It's been a top priority. Uh, the, reality, uh, the reality is we forward deployed uh, destroyers to, to Rota, so we lost four ships from the East Coast. Uh, uh, when we dropped an aircraft carrier and uh, uh, moved an ARG uh, to Mayport, uh, when you look at the uh, half the ships underway, 100 deployed, the reality is that the, uh, the workload, uh, everything worked against the workload in Hampton Roads in 2016 and created this valley. We are looking longer term as well to make sure we don't, we don't find ourselves in the same position down the road. Uh, and so our long term planning is improving uh, so that we have lead time away to address issues before they emerge. Uh, but right now, uh, the, the Warnack notices have gone out. We're doing what we can to mitigate. And uh, 
what I leave on the table when I'm done talking about this issue is if you see something that we're not doing that we should be doing, put it on the table, we'll work that also. Okay? Okay. Thank you, sir. Hi. Good morning, sir. Megan Eckstein with U.S. Naval Institute News. Um, you mentioned in your speech the $6 billion in savings you've achieved through uh, contract efficiencies. Um, last week you spoke about the idea of trying to squeeze another Virginia class submarine into 2021. And yeah. I was just wondering what work's going on right now to kind of work with the, that contract and the ORP contracts to create efficiencies to allow that. And absolutely. Um, here, here's, here the, uh, here's the reality. Uh, uh, first, I think if everybody here that's paying any attention, any attention, knows that uh, uh, we're going to be staring at a significant shortfall in terms of numbers of attack submarines uh, within a decade. And uh, this, this, again, goes back to the 1990s uh, and uh, the first, uh, first part of this century when we were building somewhere between zero and one submarine a year. So we created that valley 10 to 20 years ago. And now, uh, now that we're building at two submarines per year, which is the rate that you've got to sustain uh, in order to meet uh, uh, the long-term submarine force structure requirement. Now that we're building two a year, we're going to run headlong into the Ohio replacement construction period. And that, that in and of itself poses some signif significant challenges in terms of, of affordability within the budget uh, and in terms of uh, the industrial base capacity to build the Ohio replacement side by side with sustaining two Virginias per year. So. Uh, uh, up to this point, the program of record has been, we will continue to build two submarines a year, but in those years in which there's an Ohio replacement, there'll be one Virginia and one Ohio replacement. Well, first year we run into that is 2021, and uh, the most important submarine that we could add to mitigate our future shortfall is that 2021 boat. That's, and that's at the back end of this fit up. So we're staring at this, at the same time, we're putting together the plan for uh, building the Ohio replacement. We spent last year doing several critical things. We locked down the technical baseline. We were able to get the specs completed to be able to push out the door, the detailed design and construction uh, RFP for the lead boat. And then quietly in the background, we've been working with industry to figure out, given this significant amount of submarine workload coming, how can we best Accomplish it, accomplish it in terms of not just efficiency, but uh, looking at uh, facility investments that have to be made at our two uh, boat yards, EB and Newport News. And uh, I'll look at not just a hard replacement, look at Virginia, look at Virginia payload model coming along the way. And, and we did, we, we laid that all out and in doing that, we identified where we have risk and also where we have opportunity. Opportunity in terms of capacity and also opportunity in terms of driving down cost. That then is followed by authorization that was given to us last year and, and some the year before by Congress called the National Sea-Based Deterrent Fund. I'm not going to get into the, uh, the religious war that's taken place in terms of the fund itself, but the authorities are critical. The authorities that they gave us, incremental funding, advanced construction authority, and a, and a key thing that allows us to look across programs across years in terms of procuring material to buy it as efficiently as possible to drive the cost down. A lot going on in submarines. All that at the same time staring at that, that drop from two to one in 2021 of Virginia. And what we see is opportunity. What we see is opportunity. And if we don't, if we don't nail that opportunity down, if we let 2021 pass, we are not going to get that boat back in the future. And it just deepens the valley that we're looking at in terms of submarine shortfall. So this year, having gotten that much done last year, this year, we're going to uh, work hard with industry to determine, can we, can we, in fact, through savings, through efficiencies, looking across multiple programs, leveraging the authorities that Congress gave us, looking at the capacity that we've got across our two submarine yards, can we get to another boat in 2021 without breaking the bank in terms of the budget? Okay? So that's our, that's our challenge. Uh, uh, more than our challenge, that's, our, that's frankly our requirement this year inside of of the shipbuilding program to figure out how to get there because it is our asymmetric advantage. It, we own the undersea domain. We cannot give it up. And uh, 2021 is our next big opportunity to uh, 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 deepen, uh, frankly, uh, deepen our hold on that. 
All right, good question. Good morning, sir. I'll take the advantage of one question. I want to take you down the cyber lane for a second. Uh, two weeks ago, ASNE and uh, FCA, and uh, in conjunction with uh, the Naval West Program and Naval Institute, did a, uh, uh, a learning session with SPAWAR where they started to roll out the first of the standards and architectures for cybersecurity and critical systems going forward. Could you talk a little bit about how, at the, at the milestone review level or at your level, the implementation, both in terms of timeline and how you're start, going to start to review the, if the introduction of cyber standards uh, into the building of new systems? Yeah, this is a, this is a, a pervasive, ubiquitous, uh, daunting, however you want to measure it, uh, the, the challenge that we have in terms of cyber. Uh, we, we have, uh, uh, and I hate to say task force, uh, because when you hear task force, you should be concerned. Um, but but, but we've, we've put together, uh, you know, the group, call them group, group of experts, our, our cyber experts, as well as our systems experts and our uh, uh, major uh, uh, syscom commanders to start to take this problem, this huge problem, and break it down into, uh, into its piece parts and uh, identify uh, uh, first Let's understand what are the standards. When we talk about cyber, cyber hard, cyber safe, that's, that's good. Those are good words. What does that mean? So let's break this down into standards that you can actually implement and apply. Okay, we're engineers to engineering uh, the solutions uh, to the problems that we've got. And uh, they've been dutifully going off and working on the 38 standards that add up to measures of cyber security. That's interesting. But then where are we today? What is our status today? If I was a commanding officer of a ship about to go on deployment, I would know what the material condition of my ship is. I would know what the training and readiness of my crew is to conduct its missions. But I probably don't have a good sense for what shape I'm in when it comes to cyber, either in terms of, of hardness, security, reliability, vulnerabilities, things of this nature. So we need, we need to get about an assessment of what, our, what shape we're in today. So you have standards. You have your own, call it cyber assessment, like a material assessment, what shape you're in. And we attack it a couple of ways. Uh, uh, the bill, the bill that comes with this, nobody knows, it's an unknowable number in terms of the bill that comes with, with cyber. And so like anything else, uh, we've got to prioritize. We've got to understand in terms of, of our vulnerabilities, what, what is the first thing we should do to shore, shore ourselves up? What's the next thing and the next thing and work, it, work our way down in terms of a prioritized list from these standards of actions we need to be taken with the ship in mind. And I'm saying ship, but it works the same ashore. With the ship in mind or the battle group in mind. Then we need to take a look at what we're doing going forward. So while we assess and attack in a prioritized fashion today's fleet, we also have to ensure that going forward, we're not designing and building in added future vulnerabilities into the future fleet. So it's, uh, it is per pervasive, it is ubiquitous, it touches everything. You know, I, I say if you're, if you're a naval engineer, you better be a cost engineer. The reality is you also have to be a cyber engineer. This is not somebody else's job. It is not. There's a, there's a tradition in, uh, I'll call it, I'll pick on ships, in shipbuilding, that if I'm the shipbuilding program manager and say you're the combat systems guy and you got a problem, well, that's your problem, okay, because I got my own problems. And, and there's been this bifurcation or this stovepiping that takes place. You can't do that. One, you shouldn't do that in combat systems either. You can't do that in cyber it, it, because it is pervasive. It's, it's machinery control systems. It's communication systems. It's in, interior communication systems. So the, uh, uh, the level of awareness has to be raised. The degree of ownership goes, cuts across the board. The prioritization in terms of how we attack this, where we are working this at, uh, uh, at an XCOM level, uh, at the four-star level in terms of understanding what the, what the issues are, understanding what the priorities are, and then making sure we got the dollars uh, flowing to match those priorities. But this is not going to be uh, a quick fix. Uh, this is going to be a long-term issue, and uh, uh, we're... Uh, uh, we're, we're playing catch up ball right now. Okay. Hi, sir. Justin Doubleday with Inside the Navy. I uh, just wanted to ask you about the Maritime Accelerated Capabilities Office that the Navy wants to stand up. 
Could you give us uh, some more insight into how that will work as far as authorities and funding? And are you considering any projects at this point for that office? Absolutely. Um, great, uh, great question. I probably should have hit on that in my remarks. Um, uh, okay, let me start with what the uh, uh, Maritime Accelerated, uh, uh, you know, the uh, MACO as, as the uh, acronym that the CNO uses. Um, okay. Uh, we talk a lot about prototyping. We talk a lot about the advantages of prototyping and things of this nature, but the reality is we don't, we don't uh, prototype either in the fashion or to the extent that we could or should in terms of readying uh, development of major capabilities for the fleet. And so uh, rather than leave this to an ad hoc approach, we're taking a much more formalized approach uh, to prototyping, but not to break it, uh, not to break it. Um, uh, we've gotten an incredible technical base, government and industry, uh, that's uh, working on some of the toughest problems that we've got. But our past practice has been that uh, a problem is identified in uh, uh, one corner of the globe, and then whoever owns that problem reaches conveniently to uh, uh, an organization or an individual or, or somehow finds a home for somebody to start work on the prototyping to address that problem. Uh, we, we can do much better. And so what we're doing under the concept of uh, rapid prototyping is uh, we're putting together, a, uh, a frankly, uh, our warfare centers, our research centers, our syscoms in a, uh, a structure so that when the fleet identifies, I've got a problem, they don't get a convenient solution. They get the best talent that we've got to start working on that. That's front end rapid prototyping, the concept being you want, to, uh, you want to bring your best and brightest to solve your toughest problems. You want to uh, get the, that prototyping effort done quicker rather than waiting a couple of years for the, uh, the more formal budget process to get it going. And uh, uh, the outcome is you're much further down the, the path in terms of development, understanding your requirements, understanding your technical risks. So before you launch into a major program, uh, you've got a, 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 uh, a more firm foundation uh, that this prototyping activity will have yielded. Or you might conclude that this dog don't hunt and you, and you kill it early. Um, that's the very front end rapid prototyping. Bigger than that um, uh, with MAKO is uh, the notion that, okay, now you're off to a good start, but you want to sustain that. Uh, you want to sustain that. But uh, if, you take, uh, if you take our uh, historical development timeline, we get into formal uh, major programs, um, uh, it's not as responsive to the threat as we need to be. And uh, so with, uh, with MAKO, you know, uh, uh, what we're going to do is establish, uh, the CNOs use the term uh, uh, a fast lane, okay, a fast lane. And that's not fast as in taking shortcuts, all right, because everybody here, okay, you take a shortcut in engineering, you're going to pay for it later. But it is uh, uh, faster in terms of taking a look at uh, uh, some of our processes and uh, the way we uh, execute our programs and figure out where can we get non-value-added time out, make sure we got the right talent working on the issues and lend the right priority to those programs that are selected for the MAKO to get them into the fleet, greater confidence that they'll get there and less time and, and presumably uh, along the way less money. All right, so pretty simple concept. We want to increase the degree of rapid prototyping that we're doing on the front end for all the right reasons and for select programs that, that meet the uh, uh, criteria in terms of priority uh, and in terms of uh, 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 risk, uh, frankly. Uh, we want to put them in this, this fast lane for uh, accelerating uh, those capabilities to the fleet, um, which will require close coordination with Congress um, and uh, uh, OSD. Um, we're going to have to uh, have the right governance board in place uh, when we select those programs, and we've got to make sure Congress knows what we're doing, give them the right insight so they can do their job in terms of oversight. Today, uh, today we have uh, a couple of programs uh, that we're starting off with, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, 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 a, a quick example that's uh, uh, in the works is long-range anti-ship missile. 
that's effectively a MACO program. Uh, started with DARPA, we did a careful transition from DARPA to NAVAIR to take over that program, and we're cutting significant time out of the timeline for developing that in response to an urgent need. Uh, the, next, uh, the next program uh, that we see will be our uh, future unmanned. Um, U-Class program, uh, the unmanned carry launch, aerial surveillance and strike system has been restructured. And uh, uh, the new program, the RAQ-25, uh, uh, now known as the Stingray, uh, uh, we see the opportunity and the need to get that capability in the fleet a lot faster than if we just follow normal uh, uh, operating procedures. So we're going to give that, push that, and use that and the LORASM as the two lead programs to pave the way for other programs to follow uh, using the MACO construct. Okay? Thank you. All right, I think I'm getting a hook. Okay. So, yeah. Mr. Stack, thank you very much. Let, let's thank the, the, the Secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.